Hi, I'm Alan Bertinoli, General Manager of Cart Circuit Audubon, located here inside the Audubon Country Club in Joliet, Illinois. We were here last time to do a basics video on karting, league racing, and just some of the fundamentals that people want to know. So this video is kind of part two. We're going to cover more of some, some of the advanced topics. So if you've gone on from some form of motorsports or you've done kind of club racing or league night racing and rental carts, you might want to invest in your own cart. You might seriously want to consider racing regionally or even bigger than that. So I'm going to have you talk to the audience about how you get started in that and kind of the different angles you can go. Right. And they're, and they're very, it's a great question because a lot of people ask that, you know, I have a cart now, what do I do with it? <laughs> I like to approach it in the most simplistic nature where um, it, it builds the confidence of, of the racer, whether it's a young racer or an older racer, you know, um, like, you know, because racing fits anything from five to senior citizen. Um, but I like to start at the club level. I think club level racing is a really good place to start. The good thing about club level racing is that it provides you with um, spec based racing, uh, which most go karting is right now but it, it's more of an entry level racing. So you're not diving into that higher regional and national level racing, which we'll talk about shortly, but it provides you with, um, I don't wanna say a lower level of competition, but more of an equal uh, starter or beginner type version of racing. It allows the racer to build confidence. It also allows, allows uh, whether you have a dad mechanic or a paid mechanic, to kind of get their feet wet into working on the go-kart because there's always somebody that needs to work on the go-kart. Right. Um, what I like about that is it provides you also a stepping stone to move into a regional series which in the Midwest here, which we race at, um, or branching out to the national level. Um, the interesting thing about it is I've seen people do it the other way around as well too, where they just dive into it feet first um, into the national level racing and, and sometimes you see them get very discouraged because you're competing against the highest level at that point in time. So explain a little bit the difference between, because I think we say club, we say regional, some people may not understand the different levels of that, so can you break that down? Absolutely. So cl club level racing is very straightforward. It's, it's generally racing at one to two tracks. There are several race tracks in the Midwest that host club level racing. Um, so, um, and it's, it's also, it's, it's a spec based racing. So it's very similar to, you know, what you're getting into in the regional and national level from a class perspective. Everything is the same. The cart has to be the way the same. You have to use the, seat, the same fuel, the same tire, uh, the same engine. Um, and there's, and it's age based as well too. But you're generally racing at one to two race tracks. Um, you hone your skills at you know something like here at the Audubon Country Club or some of the other tracks that are around. If you're, you know, if you live in Wisconsin or in Indiana, they have the club level racing, um, and you're generally racing the same group of people every week. That's a great way to build camaraderie. It's a great way to learn too because there's a lot of sharing going on with people that are more than willing to say, oh yeah, this was my experience. This is what you do in this circumstance. Um, now the regional level is, is, is a little bit different in the fact that you're traveling to generally about four to five different racetracks per year, but it's in a geographical region. So let's say the Midwest, and I'll use an example of the Route 66 Sprint Series, which is, is probably the premier regional series in the Midwest as well as the United States. They travel to about four to five different racetracks in, in the Midwest, but it's also spec level racing, so it's very fair. Um, and it's a combination of two and four cycle racing, so it accommodates just about anybody. You can race a Briggs 206, or you can race an IAMI uh, uh, 60 to a K100, and, and so on. And they host uh, races anywhere from the rookie level, which would be you know ages seven all the way up to senior citizens. Um, the national level is one, in, you know, it's one step higher, where you're competing anywhere that re that national level rate. Uh, excuse me, that national level race competes at. So you could be in Sonoma, California, you can be in New Orleans, you could be in Miami, Florida. It requires a lot more commitment, a lot more travel, a lot more expense, and you're competing at the highest level at that point in time. So you'll see the big semis pull in with the big teams and the big tents, um, and that's where you'll see you know, some people that are actually getting paid to go drive go-karts. Okay. So like the first video, we talked about rental leagues or rental nights where you come in, arrive and drive and go home. There's no commitment to equipment other right. than your safety stuff, even if you wanna buy that, but even that's loaned out. Yeah. So really what you're honing your skills there is just knowing where to be on the track. Right. You, you, don't, you kind of lose that 
go the fastest lap possible qualifying lap mentality that you get on like track days and all that and you're really working through the field understanding the the, the mental part of racing there but there's a, a point where you're going to cap out so we get into club racing so what kind of skills is that going to bring to the table so it's a completely different skill set because um it's a more advanced skill set so you're driving a go-kart that's probably about 200 pounds lighter than our rental cart. So it reacts a lot quicker. Um, there's a lot more tuning capability because let's face it with the rental carts, it's not like you can, hey, uh, can I need to reset the front end on this go-kart. Um, it is what it is, you get what you get. Um, and so with, once you get your own go-kart, you have the ability to make fine tuning adjustments. And, and that's, you not only learn your driving skills, which is really cool, but you learn how to um, you know, oh, my cart is, you, you start understanding what the cart's doing. Hey, you know, the front end is, you know, it's not steering right, it's pushing, um, some call it understeer, or the back end is stepping out on me, it's sliding. Then, you know, you talk to your counterparts or you make experimental changes with either the front or the back end of the go-kart. So you're not only learning how to drive, you're learning how to tune the go-kart. And, and that really happens early on in the process. Um, and as the driver gets older, they understand a lot more about the go-kart. You don't really get that much with a really young driver. You have to almost anticipate the words that they tell you and make those changes. So um, that's what I like about you know, the, the entry-level racing. It allows you that room to grow um, and uh, room to learn as well, too. Hi, I'm Brian Janty, karting club racer of a CR125 shifter and a KA100. I have won zero dollars in my career racing, but I've spent a few dollars on racing. Uh, so, came out to Audubon Kart Circuit today, brought out two of my karts. After telling everybody that the motor was bulletproof, honestly, I've had no issues with it for at least four years that I've run it. Uh, I forgot to knock on wood and I blew the motor. So, we did get some footage, but uh, the reality of racing is it doesn't always go as planned. And, that's why I have two carts though. I can race the other one. I, I feel like the big bar or the roadblock for most people is the accessibility gets, it gets very intimidating when you get to that level. So I think that first step is really helpful. But when you get behind the wheel of a cart that you're purchasing at this point to do your club racing and you're learning the setup, this can take you, I mean, if you're just a regular person that has a nine to five job <laughs> and you still have to travel to do some of these club races, it's not something you're just gonna go for a couple hours and come back. You gotta pack the car up, you gotta pack the gear. It, it definitely takes more than a year. All right. Um, and the, the, some, some view it as fun, some view it as frustrating. So the interesting thing we talked about, I think in our vis first video too as well, that as the, the track changes as the day goes on, and we'll be, we, we can talk more about this later, but as the track changes, you make changes to the go-kart. And that comes after a couple years of, of learning. <laughs> right, yeah. So you, and, and it's more along the lines of if, if you're a driver tuner, like if you're, in, which happens with a lot of people, they just, they work on their own go-kart. If you have your dad or your, your guardian or, or somebody working on your go-kart, they have to anticipate, okay, as the day goes on, the track changes. They have to make a real minor tweak to air pressure, to the front end or the rear end of the go-kart. So I know we're getting a little far in the weeds here, but. But I just want to paint a picture of, okay, you go to the club level, you got this set up. What is the, the typical buy-in for a spec cart? Like just if you're gonna buy a new cart, you're gonna buy some of the basic gear, the safety equipment, mm -hmm. and obviously you gotta figure out a way to get your cart there or you can pay to store it at that local track. Correct. But what would you just approximate? Is it like five grand, is it 10 grand? Um, I, think, I think a fair estimation, and that's, that's another great question, and I think people are always asking that, what am I, what am I getting into here? Um, a fair estimation, by the time you buy the cart, um, the engine, um, a, 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 a suit, and, and I always recommend a very high quality helmet because um, you can't, you know, what's your head worth? Um, a rib vest, pair of gloves. Um, shoes are kind of optional. You can wear a wrestling shoe or you can wear a racing shoe. You're, and realistically, you're probably looking about $10,000 to get into it. And then um, if you don't have anything to transport it with, you have to have a vehicle big enough to put the go-kart in or a small trailer. Okay. So that's, that's a different subject. Right, yeah, of course. So if you're looking to get into club racing and you're trying to figure out what cart to buy, uh, there's a couple things I, I would recommend you, you look into. One, I'd reach out to your local club just to see what classes are popular. 
Uh, one club could have a certain type of cart that's way more popular than another club. Uh, I raced the two clubs in Wisconsin and the, the cart counts are different amongst the two tracks. Uh, a lot of it's based on the fact of just the, the design of the racetrack or the cart track. So be sure that you reach out to your cart club and, and, and ask what, what are the most popular classes. You also want to take into account uh, the finances you're willing to spend. Um, the faster the cart, obviously, the more money you're going to spend. Uh, and then two, you want to look at reliability. Four-stroke carts generally are going to be super reliable, but they're not going to be the quickest cart, cart in the world. Uh, two strokes, also reliable, a little more maintenance, but uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors, but I think if you're looking to be competitive in karting, you're going to want to be sure that you're getting something that everyone else is driving. So what are the biggest bars or the biggest roadblocks to go from club racing to the national level? Is it, well, I'm sure it's a multitude of factors, but when you did it with your son, when you made that transition, clearly you were just you and your son. You didn't have, I'm assuming you didn't have big corporate sponsors. You didn't have any of that. No, no, but what's a very good idea if you're planning on going to that next level, even, even the regional level, uh, but the national level, so to speak, is, is try to associate yourself, um, whether you're paying for it or not, is to associate with your, a team that can transport your equipment. So unless you're willing to, you know, it, from the regional perspective, it's not that difficult because you can, you can buy a small trailer and a truck or even an SUV, um, even some cars can tow a small trailer that can have a, have a go-kart in it. Car, carts aren't that, ex, uh, that heavy uh, once you have all your gear and spares and so forth. But it's a really good idea and a lot of the teams have these, um, not they have arrive and drive programs where you don't even need to have your own equipment. And that's, that's a completely never, another subject yeah. as well too. But if you have your own equipment, they'll transport it for you and they'll have a tent for you when you show up. So um, there's a cost associated with that, of, of course. But sometimes it's actually, it's better to pay that cost than to try to travel there by yourself you know, you have, you know, if you're traveling for a long distance, you know, we live in the Midwest here. Uh, there's a lot of racing in the Midwest, but some of the national series, like as an example, um, you know, there's a national series competing in, in, in Utah this weekend. It's a long haul right. from here. Las Vegas is a long haul. Sonoma, California is a long haul. Even, even New Orleans or, or Southern Florida is a long haul. And to try to make that trip by yourself, it's, it, it, it may cost a few more bucks to have a team bring it there, but it, it eases up on the stress level. Uh, and it's not for everybody, but that's kind of how I'd recommend go about it. How the hell do you do you make that time? Now, I'm thinking about it like this is one of the reasons why I never did it. Mm -hmm. When you have a job, right? Uh, in a, you know, typically you're not. It's not that flexible. You can't just bail out of your job to prep and do all this stuff and then burn a weekend right. like burnt being burned up, but with travel and then coming back right back to a job. It's hard. How, how do you do it? Uh, a lot of Red Bull. <laughs> just kidding. No, yeah, um, I'm I'm a real high energy person. Um, I, I get I I can tell you that, um, and and I'm being very honest here. Is when I would come back from a national event, um, it would it would take me about three days. I, I would go back to work on Monday, but it would take me about three days to feel normal. So you have that adrenaline going still. You're exhausted. Um, and you know, it, it, depending on how many carts you know your driver's driving, if he's driving one, it's usually not too bad. If you're driving two carts in a given weekend, you're gassed. I think that that kind of goes into one of my last questions about this topic. Mm -hmm. Is we've kind of covered a very wide, you know, we need to get more focused on this later on. But from the personal side, and we touched on this briefly in the first video. When your son was younger, you got him into this very early on and you noticed that he was very successful. Can you talk to me about his level of success early on, where he started from and where he is now and the successes he's had right. and where your mentality of, because usually people want to know what the end game is, right. like what you're doing this for. Right. And I think that's the tricky part because people get it in their head and especially with kids. And mm -hmm. I, I know parents that are like, oh, I want my kid to be the best. I want him to have a professional career. And I, so I, you've been through this, so I want you to explain it. Yeah. So, so um, racing is like any other sport. Um, the reality of it is the top, you know, like baseball, basketball, football, stick and ball sports, um, a, very, very, a very small percentage actually make it to that to car racing or you know, open wheel or sports car racing, a, ver a very small percentage. Um, so um, 
the progression level, and that was the question that you asked me, right? You wanted you wanted to know how how his success went. So yeah. So we 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 started off in a kitty cart. He was five years old, um, and it was hard. It was really hard to tell at that point in time uh, until he moved in, because the kitty cart is from five, five, six, and seven years old. Um, uh, at seven. In some clubs, you could move up to the what, we, what they call the rookie class, which is a, a full-size cart. Um, and then I, when I saw him move into the full-size cart, so the kitty cart was just a learning tool that there was, you know, it was there's really nothing really to gauge that about. It was it's just learning how to drive, use the gas and the brake, and steer the cart. Um, so when he moved into the rookie level, which is um, uh, what's what they call a uh, a cadet style cart, it's a little bit smaller than a full-size cart. And we were doing club level stuff, and then we dabbled in some of the regional stuff. Um, he at um, at, year, at year, eight years old, he won his first club championship. And when I saw him standing next to a trophy that was taller than he was, it was it was it was like motivation to go go further. So we continued on in the club, and then we ventured off into the re, into the regional level. He was still racing cadet carts, but he moved from um, like a rookie to um, a, a full. Uh, a full cadet, which is a little bit less restricted, a little bit more weight carrying, and um, after two years there, he won. He won his first regional championship. Okay. We won a couple junior championships at the regional level. Uh, we dabbled in the national stuff and did pretty decent, uh, good enough to say this is probably going to go somewhere. Um, and then the turning point was the first very. We had never raced a Supercar USA race before uh, until we went to Las Vegas. Um, and it was his first year racing junior, and it was an international field of 80 drivers um, trying to uh, make a field of like 35 carts, and he qualified fourth. And uh, long and short of it, he won one of the heat races, and um, he ended up he ended up standing on the podium, first time out there, which is is a it's 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 one of the hardest races to compete in. Um, so we kind of knew at that point in time this was going to go somewhere. Um, the following year after that, he won three national championships. Wow. And then the following year, which is first senior year, um, we also won the inaugural K100. It was the first year that the K100 came to the United States, and he was the inaugural uh, K100 senior uh, national champion. And then from there, we've been dabbling in, you know, just doing you know, one-off races here and there. We focused a little bit on SCUSA and USPKS. Um, and now that he's in college, um, that's that's really the focus right now. But he had he had a tryout with Mazda last year, okay. um, and he's going to do some sports car stuff this year, as well as uh, giving back to uh, actually working to do coaching. So he's um, he's a well respected coach right now. Okay, um, he's in high demand, and um, he he loves it because he can work in in the sport that he loves. He doesn't have to you know. He doesn't have to go to a regular regular job yeah. that some some of the kids his age do, and, and it's great. I think that's like you said. There's a lot of sports, more team sports to get involved with. The, you know, you could have the best laid plan, the best people, injuries, mm -hmm. illness, whatever. You know, or in the case of motorsports, mechanical problems, right, right. logistical issues, money. <laughs> so let's let's kind of close this out talking about the financial part and what you're really oh up boy. against. When you get to the high level, and I've heard multiple stories from people that competed at a high level in karting. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, you go to a national level and you're seeing toter homes pull up mm -hmm. or trailers and huge budgets, almost seemingly endless budgets to yes. compete at this level. So that can be almost, I mean, that would make me check out. Honestly, if right. I knew it was just me and my kid right. uh, and I had a small budget, I would not want to try to compete with that. So how does, I talk, just kind of talk the viewers briefly through that experience. So I'm a personal example and so is my son. It's possible because that was us. Okay. Okay. Even though at, that, at, at the level when he was winning national championships, he was associated with a team, but I was still doing all the work on the go-kart. Okay. Um, you know, we got input from the team, but it was still just me and him. Um, we had backing from from teams and so forth like that, but um, but it was you know it was it was a lot of the pocketbook was it, it was coming out of my wallet. Um, so it is possible for the average the average guy, and I, and I consider myself an average guy to compete at that level. It's very difficult, uh, and, and it is it is very intimidating at time, but it is it, it is very possible. Um, so a realistic number for somebody to go and do a national event um, one national one event. national event a realistic number 
um, with, and I'm counting entry fees, tires, um, engine rebuild costs, um, travel, hotel, everything as you're uh, realistic, you're, you can easily drop $5,000. For one event? For one event. Okay, and how many events would you typically go to a year? So we would usually do... Like in the peak of when you were going? So there was, uh, it was probably about um, seven to eight nationals per year. Okay. Yeah. So. And that's five grand, do you think, at a minimum to be competitive, or is that a good target? That's a, probably a good target, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to scare anybody away here. It's, it's a realistic number. Right. Um, and then, um, you know, as you get, you know, as, as and this happens to not every, to every driver, but as you get, you know, you, you, you get support from people from time to time. You know, you might find an individual or a team owner that, you know, is looking to help you out in some ways, and it can cut into that. But, I mean, like I said, from an individual that's looking to do it on their own, um, you probably could do it for less. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I've always used as an example to people when you, uh, in racing, when you, when you start to cut corners, it ends up costing you more in the long run. So it's like, oh yeah, uh, that chain can make it another race. And then, you know, if you break a chain in the middle of the race, what do you get out of it? Right. You yeah. get, you get no finish versus, you know, some experience of at least finishing the race and being in there. Um, so, um, sometimes it's better to spend a little bit more to, to uh, make sure that you finish the race to get that good experience rather than to cut corners. And you're, let's face it. If you, you know, if something breaks, <coughs> Excuse me, you're gonna have to replace it anyway, so we're not, why not replace it before the race? Okay. So in summary, we came out today, we had some fun, we ran both of my carts. Uh, unexpectedly, uh, we did blow a motor. Uh, you know, it can happen in karting, it's just the reality of racing in general that you're going to break things. The nice thing about kart racing is, relatively, relatively speaking to a car, the, the expense to repair that motor is going to be much less than, than a race car or, or a car. So I'm probably looking at about a thousand dollar rebuild on the motor, but I'll be able to run that thing for years and probably, you know, knock on wood, have no more issues. Um, but that is something that needs to be, you know, taken into account if you are looking to get into karting. Um, but the things that I've learned from karting is that, you know, the, the, the sport is, the camaraderie of the sport is incredible. You can race with all types of different people. You're always going to have someone to run with. You can race at any age. Um, it's taught me great race craft. It's taught me how to work and wrench on my own cart. It, I've learned setup techniques, techniques that I never would have known unless I had gotten into the sport. Um, but really, the camaraderie of the club racing scene is unbelievable. We, we oftentimes will race and at the end of the day, we'll, our group will get together, we'll drink beer and smoke cigars and, and just kind of hang out and tell stories about racing. So it's, if you're looking to get into, uh, get into karting, I highly recommend it. Come out to Autobahn, try out their karts. If you think you, it's something you want to get into, just know that there's always uh, higher levels of karting out there. So highly recommend it. So that was a lot of information. We're going to continue this series, but that's enough for today. But thankfully, Alan is willing to help us out, kind of paint the picture, get people into this, and hopefully come out to Audubon Country Club to drive the karting track. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's a lot for coming out here. It's my pleasure to actually work with you guys. I love it. Um, plus, I get to see you guys. We, we, have, we have a good time talking, and um, um, I, I love sharing the information that, I, that I've been able to um, absorb over the last you know 13 or 14 years um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to work here I mean I'm, I'm passionate about racing I love being around cars and go-karts and um, I really appreciate you guys coming out it's it's a lot of fun yeah Thank, th thanks th a lot thanks for having us